Greetings, beloved. I am Antoinette Bolden. Thank you for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast with Brother Hawk Bolden and I. We pray that during this message, the Holy Spirit will open up God's truth to you and you will receive deliverance in every area of your life. For the word declares in John 8 and 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So stay tuned and be blessed by today's message. And so we thank God for those encouraging words and uh, we thank God for the worship service that have gone forth and uh, uh, we're going to get into the things that the Lord want, want uh, us to go a little bit further in. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, go to the fourth chapter of Luke. And, and some of you may be wondering why this picture is up here. Those that are, are watching uh, and those that are present with us uh, may be wondering why this picture is here. And, and we're going to get into that in a second. And uh, the, for those that, that uh, are listening that may not see the picture, uh, there's a picture of myself up here uh, uh, when I was a year old. That my mother took me, I guess, somewhere. I don't know where this picture was taken, but she took me somewhere to take uh, for this picture to be taken on my first uh, birthday. And we're going to get in and we're going to explain why this picture is here. So <clears throat> the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, and this is Jesus Christ uh, right after he has been tempted by the enemy and right after he has uh, overcome the enemy. Uh, he has gone to the synagogue in Nazareth uh, to, to profess his calling. And so we're going to read this, start reading at verse 16. It says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, I think that's very interesting. He didn't say that he has sent me to heal the sick, even though we know that that was a part of his commission. He said that he had sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. That means that it's got some people in God's assembly and in the world that are sick of a broken heart. Yeah. Yes. That need to be healed. And Jesus said he had sent me to heal the broken heart. And now that lets us know what kind of God we serve. A, a God that says that sees you're going to go through some things in life. It's going to be some people that you come across that's going to break your heart. Yes. Amen. And I'm not going to tell you, you just need to get over it. You just need to go get some counseling. He said, I've come to heal the broken hearted. You see that? It's, in other words, God is concerned about the effects of the things that you've gone through in life. He's not just saying, well, you shouldn't have loved that person. You shouldn't have never failed for them or you shouldn't have never put yourself in a position to be brokenhearted. He said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. When you are done allowing the world to beat up on you and when you are done seeing what the world is really made of, God says, I'm here to heal that broken heart. Why? Because you're not supposed to be a part of the world in the first place. I want you to come from among them and see who your true friends are. And, you know, I've run across people. They say, well, you know, I have friends here and I have friends. Let me tell you something. Outside of God and God's people, you don't have any friends. Amen. Amen. You have to understand what a true friend is. You may say, well, this person uh, gave me something to eat on this day. Or this person helped me out in this manner. Listen, if they're not... Helping your soul make it to heaven. Come on. Because people will drag you with them. They're on their way to hell and they will drag you with them. And you say that they're your friends. They're not your friends. If they're not concerned about your end result, and that's you getting to heaven, you see. And so God says that he come to heal the brokenhearted, uh, to preach deliverance to the captives. You see that? Now, that's another thing we have to understand. Uh, the other day, I received an email. Uh, I guess it was from a, a young man uh, who, who said that he was blessed by the ministry. And uh, he's, he, of course, looking at the title of the ministry, God's Truth and Deliverance. Uh, he said, by the way, what is a deliverance ministry? And so I pointed him back to this scripture, uh, what Jesus said, to preach deliverance to the captives. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, there are people in this world who are bound. Yes. Yeah. And yes. the devil is their warden. They're, they're in jail. And I, I've seen that in, in visions and dreams that, that people were in prison and didn't know it. That's 
right. You see, uh, you may say, well, you know, I, I go to work, I come home, I go to the store, I come home, I can move about freely, uh, you know, and, and everything is fine. I can move about freely. And, but, but, you know, the devil doesn't care about you being able to move freely. What does it look like in the spiritual realm? Yes. yes. Now, in the natural realm, you can move about how you want to, you see. But in the spiritual realm, what takes place? You go home and there's something on the inside, something in your life that you are bound by, that you don't want to be bound by, right. you see. Some people are bound by smoking. Some people are bound by drinking. And even though it's your free will and even though it's, it's something that you have made a choice to do, a lot of times people get bound by those things. Now, how do you know if you're bound when you cannot set yourself free from those things? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Glory to God. That's and see, and God has a way of letting us know no matter how uh, much power we have in our own selves, when we get to the point where we say, okay, Lord, I can't do this. I, I can't quit smoking on my own. I can't quit drinking on my own. I can't quit fornicating. I can't quit doing these things. That's when God says, I can step in now and help you. Because you can't free yourself from sin. It takes God to free you from sin. You see, and that's something God wants us to know. That We wonder, why is it that I can't stop doing this? Why is it that I can't stop doing that? It's because we are all born in sin and we are all born the servants of sin. Yes, yes. And so when Jesus came, he said, a man must be born again. Amen. What does that mean? Born out of the outside of the bondage. Yes, you have yes, to be born yes. that second time so that you are born in the spirit of God. And Amen. the Bible says where well, the spirit of God is, there is liberty. Amen. Yes, yes. And God wants us to understand that. All right. It says, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to preach the accept acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. In other words, they're looking now, who is this? Hmm. And, and what, why is he reading this? And I, I want you to notice what's taking place here. He went in this word in the book of Isaiah and found himself, found his ministry. And that is something that God wants us to do with his yes, word. Yes, yes, he yes. wants us to go in his word and find ourselves yes. and find the word that applies to our lives. Yes. Yes. God's word is not just there for us to get some good stories. Oh, well, praise God. He delivered the, the Hebrew boys and, you know, praise God. He did this. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Amen. Amen. That means that the same God that delivered the Hebrew boys can deliver us today. Yes. Amen. You've heard me use this analogy. You see, we're, we're coming up on, uh, pretty soon it's going to be fall and then winter. And, and uh, you, you, we, my wife and I, we have a fireplace in our home. And, of course, in, in the wintertime, we, we'll light up that fireplace so that the fire is gone. Uh, you, and it's a real fire. Now, children may have to find that out the hard way. That that's not a picture there. That's a real fire. That's right. Now, the Word of God is not just a picture. Come on. That's right. Come on. It, it's real. Yeah. Come on, preach it now. You know, <laughs> when, they, when the Pharisees came to try to trip Jesus up about, you know, and they asked him, well, there was a woman uh, who had married a man, and the man died, and then she married his brother, right. and he died, and he married yeah. this, she yeah. married this person. Yeah. So whose wife is she going to be in heaven? And Jesus said, well, in heaven, uh, well, you err, not knowing the, not knowing the, the uh, scriptures nor the power of God, because in heaven... People are as angels. There's no marriage. There's no giving in marriage. Yeah, there's no right. marriage in heaven. You see? And he said, and besides that, God is the God of the living, not the dead. And all through the word, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other yeah, words, yeah. those three are still alive. They may not be in flesh, but they're still alive. And what God is saying is that his word is still alive for us today. Yeah. But it doesn't become real. All this Bible is is a history book to you until God becomes real in your life. Amen. And he wants us to Amen. know that his word is real. That the same God that healed people back then is still healing people. That's why we have the word. It's to know that he's still the same. Still the same God. And so if we light that fire, it's a real fire. It's not a picture there. And oftentimes in church, uh, uh, people are going by a picture. In other words, it's, it's cold and it's winter time in their lives. But all the Bible is to them is a picture. Now, you can put a picture of a fire up there. It's not going to warm you. It's not going to do you any good. It looks good, right. but it, it's not going to warm you. You need the real fire. Amen. 
And oftentimes that's what takes place in, in the lives of people. They just go and buy the picture. Well, praise God, God was good back then. You see? And God said, no, I'm still a fire. Amen. I, Amen. I can still warm you up when winter time comes, you see? And that's what he wants us to understand. And so here, these people, their eyes are fastened on Jesus. Why? Because he went back in Isaiah to let them know the things that have been read that I just read. That's what's in your face today. This is what you're focusing on. Yes. You see, when Jesus came, he preached the word. He said, tell the people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Yes. Right. Amen. You see, in other words, it's here now. That's right. You see, and that's what God wants us to still preach, that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's still here dwelling on the inside of us. Amen. So verse 21 says, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He says, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Now, that's what people will do for you uh, uh, when you go in God's word and, and you find yourself and you say, God have called me to preach. Mm -hmm. uh, God have called me and given me a deliverance ministry or how, whatever, however God works through you. They will identify with the natural side of you. Come on. Come on. Everybody understand? Oh, yes. Now, oh, yes. what they ask is this Joseph's son. Now, we know that he was not Joseph's son. And people will identify that. Well, are you not the same person who I was clubbing with? <laughs> are you not the same person I was drinking with? In other words, who are you to say that this day this scripture is fulfilled? Who are you to come and preach to me now? You see? But we have to stand on God's word and we have to let people know, yeah, I, I was that person. Yeah, I was that person that was in the club with you. I was that person that was drinking with you. I was doing all of those things. But now I'm here to tell you that I've been born again. That person that was with you is dead. You see, and now I'm born again. All right. Verse 23. And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save the, unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now, what is he telling us there? If you look at these, these two uh, uh, places here, these people were not Israelites. Uh, they were Gentiles. And what the Lord is saying here is that these two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, they weren't even sent to Israel to do these great works. You see, they were sent to the to the people that were on the outside of Israel. Why? Because a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own kin. In other words, we can limit what God wants us to do because we don't receive the person that God sends to us. Come on. Amen. Come on. See, they had already had an attitude. Well, you know, if you're such a great prophet, then the things we heard you doing over in Capernaum do also here. In other words, we want to see it. We want to see it. We're not just going to believe it. We want to see you do it. In other words, prove yourself. And he's telling them, I'm, I'm telling you that you're going to say, physician, heal thyself. In other words, deliver yourself. Get, get off that cross and do all of this. You see, God's word is sent to those people that's ready to receive it. That's why you have people that can sit under the same exact word, hear the exact same thing. But because they can't get over what the preacher is wearing or, 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 and things like that, they cannot receive what God has to say, you see. And so God wants our hearts to be right before him. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll start in on, on this, this story. Uh, let's go real quick. If you have your Bibles to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. 16th chapter of the book of Acts, and this will take us into what we're, what we're going to uh, speak on today. Today we're just going to uh, do a, a testimony. And uh, we pray that people will be blessed uh, by what they hear concerning this testimony. Now, this is, of course, this is Paul and Luke and, and their company. And, uh, and this is what we call a, a Macedonian call. This is where this term comes from. Many of us have heard of that term. And so we're going to explain this in a, in, in a few words and then we'll get into uh, a few things here. 
verse 6 and the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. It says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, I think that's very important uh, that we notice that, that these, these people, uh, Paul and his company, they were forbidden to preach by the Holy Ghost in Asia. And, and that lets us know uh, that, that we, we don't have our own say-so in when God uses us and where he uses us. They were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach in Asia. And I don't know why. The Bible doesn't get into detail. It's just the Lord wanted them somewhere else, you see. Yeah. And so they were forbidden and they could have said, well, you know, it's a good idea. We're passing through here. So let's let's go. On, let's go ahead and preach through. But see, this says that they were forbidden uh, by the Holy Ghost. And that lets us know that it's important that we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You see, Amen. verse seven, it says after they will come to Mysia, they are saved to go into Bithynia. But the spirit suffered them not. So they're still being led by the spirit on where to go and, and when to go and all of these things. Verse 8, and they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia uh, and, and, and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, and assuredly uh, gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now that's where we get the term Macedonia and call. It is when God send you to a particular place for a particular reason. And, and sometimes, you know, our whole lives, if we will think about it, it's a Macedonian call. God want us to be somewhere at a particular time. But what we have to do is move our own will out of the way. Yeah. You see, we have to move our own will out of the way. Now, getting into this story, uh, back in, in uh, around 1950 and 1951, uh, uh, my daddy was living in Mississippi. And he was uh, uh, working on a job, and of course this is you know this is down south, and so back then they had Jim Crow laws and things like that, and they weren't really treating blacks well, and, and so a lot of the blacks on that particular job were fired, you know, and uh, had lost their jobs because you know I guess um, um, I, I don't know why they said that I was told that the man was racist and you know and something had happened on the job and just but all the blacks got fired. And so my daddy, he moved uh, to Louisiana, to my hometown, and uh, that's where he began to work. And, he, and several families followed him. You know, he, he went over there, found a job, and he said, hey, they hiring people over here. They hiring black people here. And so he went over back to Mississippi and told the people about it. And a lot of the family members uh, moved uh, back to, moved to Louisiana from Mississippi. They have whole families that weren't even kin to us that moved there because they were looking for work, you know, and that's what black people did back then especially. Uh, they moved wherever work, wherever people were hiring. That's where they, they moved. And so he had worked, he was a logger, and he worked in the logging industry for years. And so uh, now we're going to fast forward. My daddy was born on April 14th, 1929, and my mother was born on, on February uh, the 27th, 1947. And so uh, uh, around the time, I guess she was about 20 years old, uh, uh, 21, uh, 22, um, she had uh, a, a great uncle of mine who was, had married my auntie, my great auntie, uh, had received a vision from the Lord that he was supposed to go to a little town named Abita Springs and preach the word there and preach Jesus Christ. And so my mother was raised in church and... Uh, she was raised in church and, you know, like a lot of people, you're raised in church, but you really don't have a, a, a relationship with God. You just know, OK, we we'll go to church, we sing, we we'll hear a message. I believe I'm supposed to live right. So I try to live right. And so when my great uncle went there to preach, uh, she got saved and she was so hungry for the word of God that she moved uh, to Derrida, my hometown in, in Louisiana with him and followed him and my aunt. Because they wanted to continue to hear the word that was preached that night, you know. So her and her cousin, Hope, uh, they moved to Derrida, Louisiana. And my mother was around 21 or 22. And so she got a job working at a little cafe. And so she's working there and she would walk to this job. And she said every day she passed by uh, in this neighborhood. And it was a man sitting out there on the porch. I always just sitting, just seemed to be sitting out there at the same time. Every day she walked by. And he would just stare at, stare at her as she passed by. And, uh, 
And of course, that made her uncomfortable because this man was older, much older than she was. And so uh, she said that one day this man asked her, you need a ride? And she said, no, thank you. I'm fine. You know, she didn't want to be bothered. You know, how women can be when a man is, they think that a man is coming on to them and they just don't want to be bothered. And so she went on to work. And she said that day on her lunch break, that man, he came in there into the cafe and she was sitting down on her lunch break eating. And she said that he walked in front of the table and stood there in front of her and said, I'm going to marry you. Mm. And, you know, now my mother at that time, she was a little bitty somebody, real slim and, and things like that. And uh, she said she looked at him and said, oh, no, no, I'm not marrying you because my daddy uh, was 6'5", and he weighed 400 pounds, you see. So, you know, that he wasn't <laughs> somebody that she had in mind. And, you know, he, he had never had a conversation with her for him to walk up to her and say, I'm going to marry you. Now, this was in 1969, at the beginning of the year. And in September 20th, 1969, they were married, you see. <laughs> so they get married, and just like most couples, they want to have children together. And so for five years, and some of you have heard me te tell this testimony uh, 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 earlier, that for five years they tried and they didn't have a child. And so finally my mother, she, she had read in the Bible about Hannah, who couldn't have a child. And, and Hannah had said, well, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. And so my mother gave, said that same prayer. Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. I'll raise him to admonish you and to fear you, and I'll give him back to you. And so not long after that, now this was five years after they were married, uh, she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, of course, she was rejoicing because she didn't think she could have children. She knew that it was a, a miracle from the Lord. And it was really God just waiting on her to say, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. Now, that lets us know that a lot of times we're praying to God and we're asking God for something. And God is waiting on us to say, God, if you will give this to me, if you will bless me with this, then I will not make a God out of it. And I will give it back to you. A lot of times we hold up our blessings because we're not in a position to receive those blessings. You see, God is not going to bless us with something that we're going to turn around and make a God out of it. You see, and so and so many people today, they make gods out of their children. You know, and make gods out of things that God blesses them with. And that's not God's will. And, and so when she got pregnant, uh, she immediately went out and found out she was pregnant. Uh, she immediately went out and, and bought all boy clothes and, and fixed up the room in the house for a boy. Nothing pink, no neutral colors, no yellow, no purple, anything. It was all blue, all boy clothes. And, and, and some of her family members and some of her friends began to taunt her and began to say, well, how you know it's going to be a boy? How you know it's not going to be a girl? And her response was, well, I prayed to the Lord that first of all, I'd be able to have a child and then that child would be a boy. So the same God that allowed me to get pregnant is going to finish it and give me a boy. So I'm not going to buy half pink and half blue. It's all blue because I'm expecting to receive what I prayed for. And so, of course, uh, uh, several months later, uh, I, was, I was born, and I was the first of, of three of the biological children that they would have together. And so this began uh, a, a life, uh, and, and I just want you to know that everybody that is born is born with a purpose from God. Amen. You could have been born out of wedlock. Come on. You could have been a result of rape, whatever. If you have a child, that child is here for a purpose. Yes. That's why God don't want us going to the clinic to kill our children. Amen. God doesn't want us doing that. God told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in a womb, I knew you. Yes. Every yes. child that he said, before I formed you. And many times we think, well, it's because mom and daddy came together that I was born. No, because you got plenty of people. They sleep together for years and never have a child. Come on. God said, I'm the one that do the farming. Even if it's outside of my perfect will, in other words, maybe you sleeping with a man that you weren't married to, whatever the case is, God says, if a child is born, it's because I ordained it. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because when that child is formed, a spirit is put on the inside of that child. And that's why we can't say, well, you know, it, it's just a little piece of, of, uh, of uh, 
You know, that's just that's not living yet. God said it is living. He said, before I formed you, I knew you. And we have to keep in mind that spirit comes first. Amen. Spirit comes first. Amen. I, I read somewhere the other day, uh, a great preacher said, the devil don't mind sending a million aborted babies to heaven if he can make a million killers in the earth. And that's something to think about it. The devil don't mind sending a million babies to heaven. In other words, when they get aborted, that's where they go. He don't mind sending a million babies to heaven. If he can make a million killers in the earth. Now, that's something for us to think about. And so God wants us to understand that none of us are here by accident. And we may have gotten sidetracked because of life and, and the things and the decisions that we've made. But we serve a God that's, that's more than able to get us back on track. That's Amen. more than able to, to help us, you know, and, and get in his perfect will. And so uh, that, that's how uh, the, the life began. And, and, uh, and as you've heard me say before. Uh, I knew that I was called to preach before I knew my name. It was just something that I just always knew and I always understood. And uh, so different things would happen in life where God would uh, validate these things. And of course, I didn't always uh, live right before the Lord. You know, I was told to start preaching when I was 12, uh, but I didn't answer that call until I was 20. And I can give you a whole list of things that went wrong in between them, those times, you see. And, but that's the way it happens. You know, when we run away from God, God's not going to bless us, chase us down with blessings. That's right. You know, he's going to whoop us. If he loves us, he's going to whoop us back into his will. Yeah. And when we get back now, it's not enjoyable and it's not something pleasant when we're going through it. But Amen. once we get into his will, we can say, Lord, I thank you Amen. that yes. you didn't just allow me to keep going yes. down the wrong path. You see, yes. and we can thank him for that. And, and so moving on down into this thing uh, on September. And I, I have some notes here because I got some specific dates. And so we're going to go over this because this is something that happens uh, several years ago. So on September 20, on, in September of 2006, uh, I, I had a very strong feeling that I was supposed to go somewhere. Now, uh, I was, as, some of you, as some of you know, I was previously married, and uh, I was married to somebody who God didn't ordain for me. And uh, we, we don't want to say anything to, uh, uh, to, to uh, put down another person's reputation or anything like that. I will just say that when we have married somebody that God didn't have for us, uh, it's not going to work out. We thank you again for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast. Prayerfully, this message has better equipped you for your spiritual journey. To request your free copy of this message in its entirety, or if you would like to submit a prayer request, you may write to God's Truth and Deliverance, Post Office Box, 23504 Nashville, Tennessee 37202 or you may submit your request by calling and leaving a message at 615-530-6138 Tune in next week same station same time for more of God's truth and deliverance Be blessed